Hello. Um, so thank you very much um, for the great honor of being allowed to speak at this meeting. Today I want to talk about critical help early for women in Africa, um, or in shorthand terms, it stands for TUA. And um, I need to sort of give a, good, a big thanks out to Naomi Sangaya, uh, the midwife who runs the critical care unit for women's health in Malawi, where I started the program, Sylvia Matengo, who's one of her colleagues, and Andrew McQuinger. Um, my name is Gloria Sibona, and I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist. And currently, I have founded and I'm directing the Institute for African Women's Health, which is a multidisciplinary think tank to really bring everybody involved in African women's health together underneath the same umbrella. Because at the moment, it seems like the African woman has been dismembered in terms of her needs. So we have midwives working on one side, doctors on the other, policymakers doing something sometimes completely different. And I felt there was a real need to have an umbrella or platform where everybody can come together to try and improve women's health um, for the better. So the objectives of um, this talk are to talk about this critical um, care program, which I started in Malawi, and to get people to understand why it's so important. Um, so I want to talk about why critical care. So by critical care, I mean the close constant watch of women with life-threatening conditions as a result of pregnancy or, or other women's health-related conditions by a specially trained person. And I want to be able to hopefully establish why I feel the midwife has to be at the forefront of that. And I want to talk a little bit about how I went about setting it up um, and then what the outcomes were and what the challenges were that we faced. So I start with why. And um, for why, I usually like to use this term, which is mad. And I always say that it's really bad that babies are dying, but it's completely mad that in 2015, mothers are dying in childbirth or from women's health complications. Completely mad because we've known for years how to um, treat and how to prevent these conditions, but women still continue to die. And they die of three main issues. Based on my experience working for more than 10 years, I would say, in the African setting, um, they die from what I call the she condition. So um, the S stands for sepsis, hemorrhage, and eclampsia or preeclampsia. Um, and the reason why I set up the critical help program was that I felt greater understanding of those conditions would really, really help to make a big dent in maternal mortality and morbidity. Um, I'm very, very passionate about stopping women from getting so advanced um, just because of simple pregnancy conditions. I always say that it's mad that mothers are dying, and there's more than one way to kill mothers. You can kill them physically, and we all know about the stats of one woman every minute or 800 women a day. Um, but for me, based on the experience I've had for the past 10 years, there's more than one way to kill women, and women are dying in their droves from physical, social, and psychological complaints. Um, so the critical health program was really a way of trying to make a dent into that. Um, so it really tries to, to tap into what I call the preventable conditions, and we hear a lot about the preventable, um, and I think those things are really important, but at the same time, we have to appreciate that there's also the unavoidable um, conditions that women are faced with. So it's not a simple case of that we can pre prevent women getting sepsis or eclampsia, preeclampsia. In the most part, we can, but sometimes it's unavoidable. They are going to get those conditions just because of their makeup, and we have to be ready for them. Um, and then, of course, there's the attributable. So um, the attributable means the things that we contribute um, towards making a woman sick in terms of you know, not having the right equipment, not having the right staff. Um, from my experience working in Africa, we have a huge number of women, for instance, that have eclampsia, preeclampsia. And it almost seems as if the, the African woman is more sicker than women anywhere else in the world. But it's not that. If we start looking back at their history, we actually find that then we're not picking up their blood pressures early. Um, so they're going through the whole of the antenatal period, not having their blood pressures picked up until the very last minute. And then they come to us very sick. And if we don't have that critical care approach for them, they are going to die. So um, we are trying to sort of work um, within these three main areas. Um, and I feel that the midwife is really, really important to working in the critical care field. 
um, just because we know that mortality goes up when you do not have enough health workers. So the WHO says that health workers should, um, there should be a ratio of 230 as a bare minimum per 100,000 of the population. And this will enable you to give at least um, basic care. But we know that in most African settings, you're lucky if you have two doctors um, and then maybe 37 or 40 midwives per 100,000. So we are way off the mark and it should not be any surprise that we are having the really, really bad numbers that we're getting, especially in the rural communities. So we have to be really innovative in how we're going to tackle maternal mortality and morbidity. And I feel, from my experience, especially having trained midwives from close to 10 years now in different African settings, Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, the midwife really is key to that. I mean, the Malawian midwives are extremely, extremely highly intelligent people. Um, and you know, as midwives, they do this kind of constant watch of the patient anyway in labor. So it's in their psyche. They have the empathy to do it. So I felt in terms of the numbers, even though they're very low in Africa per 100,000 of the population, in terms of numbers and also in terms of their inherent skills to deliver this intensive care, the midwife is the ideal person. And I call her the madwife. And in the UK, if you use the term madwife, it's not really seen in positive terms. But for me in Africa, the experience I have, I think madwife should be seen as a more affectionate term. You know, we need more madwives in Africa, madwives who are really upset and angry that mothers are dying and really want to do something about it. Um, and I feel that if we have more, mid, more um, madwives or midwives, it will help them with CPD. It will help to improve the environment in which they work, which is extremely poor. And of course, will help with motivation and retention. So how did um, I go about setting up this critical care unit in this hospital in Malawi? Well, it was done in four days, and even now I still can't believe that it actually um, happened um, within that four-day period. Um, but we started in a central hospital in um, Blantyre, which is the commercial capital of Malawi, called the Queen Elizabeth Central. And this hospital has um, sometimes as much as 15,000 deliveries a year. And for those 15,000 deliveries, they're lucky to have 35 midwives in total caring for those women. So the midwives are really working flat out. Um, the hospital has a four-bedded intensive care unit, which is for the whole hospital, not just for women's health. And often we cannot get our patients in there. And of course, that was leading to a high number of maternal deaths because many of the health centers were referring their patients into the central hospital. Um, and of course, they were, they were arriving in really poor condition. We couldn't get them into ICU. There was no specific area to look after them in, in the hospital. So there were 12 maternal deaths um, when I started this program in November 2013. Um, and if we use the ratio of every woman that dies, there are maybe about 20 to 30 who are severely injured then that basically equates to about 360 near misses or morbidities. And then we were losing about 60 babies a month. So um, I went out with Miata Kapakra, who's a HDU trained or critical care trained midwife from the UK um, to help deliver the initial training. Um, you can see here on the left, we have Ellen Cherwa, who's the director of nursing and midwifery, a very visionary, passionate director of midwifery. Um, and we collaborated together to start this program. And um, she invited midwives in Queen Elizabeth Hospital, but also representatives from the 25 health centers who feed in to Queen Elizabeth Hospital and send the really bad cases to us. And we started with the premise that these people, they're experts. So I didn't want to stand in front of them. You can see me on the right saying, I know everything there is to know about critical care, and I'm going to tell you how to do it. They really had to work out things for themselves. So we started with three basic questions at the beginning, which was, why do we need a critical care unit? Um, and they quickly realized, after lots of discussion, that there was not a need for something like this, which was lots of staff, lots of equipment, because, of course, they couldn't reach that level. Um, why, you know, why do they need a, a critical care unit? What does it involve? Um, and what would it look like? Um, so what they decided was it was not enough just to have a, a unit or an area within Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. We needed to be able to feed into the health centers, um, feeding into Queen Elizabeth, because what was happening is that women were coming extremely sick because they were not recognized or um, treated quite early on, and then Queen Elizabeth couldn't cope with them. So we really wanted to establish a network feeding around Queen Elizabeth. So the philosophy um, that we started with was the midwife decides if you live or die, and that's such 
a profound statement. The midwife decides if you live or die. Um, and we went forward with that because, you know, the midwife quickly understood that she stood between the woman dying or staying alive. You know, if she didn't take those initial actions, she's with the mother, she's by her bedside all the time. She doesn't take those actions to recognize and then intervene and refer, then that woman is going to die. So the midwife immediately took ownership of this critical health program. Um, and another principles that we tried to um, instill in them was what we call the art of critical help. So, you know, what we were trying to do is not just sit down in a, in a unit and wait for the woman to come to us really, really sick. We wanted them to understand that, you know, we do not want to push babies and mothers to their physiological limits. Um, so the art of helping these women was to stop them getting pushed so far that the limited resources that we had at Queen Elizabeth, for instance, was not enough to sort of meet their needs. So it was really about um, anticipation or prevention. And this is the reason why the health center midwife was so important. Anticipate, prevent these horrible conditions. Um, but then if a woman is becoming sick, recognize early so we can bring the woman back from extremists quite early on. Um, and then timely intervention. Um, and that basically just stands for art. So we gave a quick pretest just to see where they were in terms of their knowledge, you know, not just advanced um, critical care knowledge, but even just basic things such as observations, what's the normal blood pressure, what's the, why is the respiratory rate so important as the first indicator the woman is sick. And that pretest actually was extremely low, it was 3%. Even when it came to things such as, you know, what's the normal blood pressure, we were getting um, values such as 210 over 170 is normal. So that helped us to establish where people were in terms of their knowledge. This is an example of one of the questions that we gave them. And then we just went straight into physiology and pathology. And um, as I said, we focused on the she conditions, so sepsis, hemorrhage, and eclampsia, preeclampsia, because we felt these were the main reasons why women are dying. If you go to any African hospital, you know, if anyone brought me their stats and asked me to look at why women are dying, these are the three main reasons. I know we've got other issues such as obstructed labor, um, unsafe abortion, but they all fall under these three main conditions. We really wanted to concentrate on this because we felt if they understood how to manage these conditions, they could manage more or less anything that came their way from a critical point of view. We wanted to move away from doing something really complex like this because midwives, even though they're highly, highly intelligent, even as a doctor, you get flawed trying to learn all of this information within four days. So we needed to sort of come up with a simpler framework um, that they could start to build their knowledge on. So we introduced things such as this within the book um, that I've written, such as, you know, when a woman comes with altered level of consciousness or temperature is high or low, or she has um, high breathing or fast breathing or slow breathing, low blood pressure, high blood pressure, pain, bleeding. Um, we introduced um, a book full of algorithms so that as soon as a woman came their way and they picked up an observation was wrong or worrying, they could actually go to the book or to the guidelines and immediately start step by step um, to, to um, manage the woman. Um, we also simplified all of the observations just down to these three observations. So pulse, respiratory rate and temperature, um, which I felt was really important. BP, of course, we covered and we covered during output, but we focused a lot on these three observations because one of the issues we were having in Malawi was lack of equipment. So I told you before about women coming with eclampsia, preeclampsia, and it's because their BPs are not getting done because there are no batteries, BP machines are not working. We all know from a physiological point of view that the BP is one of the last things to go off anyway. And these um, observations here actually give you a lot of information quite early on. And you don't even need equipment to do these observations. You don't have to be clinically trained to do these observations. So we focus on these three observations and, of course, focus on the other things as well, such as the urine output. So we use novel things such as, you know, knowing whether a woman was um, dehydrated or was passing urine okay by equating it, for instance, to soft drink. So Coca-Cola means that, yes, this woman is really dehydrated. It goes sometimes along with eclampsia, preeclampsia. Sprite usually means that she's well hydrated. So we use really innovative techniques to really get them thinking. Um, and then one of the big innovations we had was thinking about the management. So when we're thinking about managing preeclampsia or sepsis, sometimes the algorithms can be quite complex for people to get their head around. So we really wanted to make it quite simple. So um, what I said to them is, you only have to think of three things when it comes to the management. 
just like you have to just think of three observations, you're going to have to think about three, um, three interventions that will help the woman. It's either that she needs O2, um, she needs something to be done fluid-wise, um, and she needs drugs. And if you've got these three things in your head, it's very easy to use this as a framework to start um, putting things onto for those for those conditions. So this is an example of what we came up with. So those of you that are familiar with this basic resource will be familiar with the left-hand side, which is the A, B, C, D, E, and how when someone comes critically um, unwell, you have to go for that algorithm. So we, we stuck with that. But on top of that, we had the anticipation part of it, and then we had the recognition. So the recognition had all of the observations underneath, and then timely intervention was oxygen, fluid, and the drugs. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I will just give you an example of what I mean by giving somebody oxygen. So it doesn't physically mean you have to give oxygen, because of course, in the health centers, in the villages, there is no oxygen. But there are other things that can be done to ensure that a woman has good oxygen delivery. So if she's pregnant, we know that we have to tilt the mother 15 to 30 degrees. That will help to give her oxygen, or you open the airway if she's obstructed. Um, from a fluid point of view, we were talking about IV fluids or giving blood or whether the patient was bleeding or not. So um, you want to think about maybe giving her fluids if she's very dehydrated or she's septic, stopping fluids or restricting fluids, for instance, in the preeclamptic or clamptic, and taking fluids by way of bloods to ensure that you know, you know where, what you're dealing with and where you're going. And then for drugs, it was, you know, do you have to give drugs? Do you have to stop drugs? So just having this framework, I mean, it seems very, very simple, but having this framework really helped people to start understanding how they could start managing the she conditions. Um, and then it was, from there, very interactive. So they had the framework. They understood that they were the experts. They understood that they decide if the woman is going to die or live. Um, and then we just started giving them scenarios, really. And step by step on that first day, they started working out, using that framework, how to manage quite complex real-life conditions that we'd picked up on the ward. And then we taught them about resus. So it was very interactive and hands-on. Now, another big part of what we had to do on that first day, and this continued throughout the um, three to four days, was we had to teach them about communication by way of documentation. Because one of the big things I found training in Africa, the documentation or, or the paper, paperwork is not fit for purpose. So without that paperwork, it's very difficult to communicate and, of course, to see that trend of when the patient's becoming unwell or getting better. So they had to get their head around being better with their communication and their documentation. And once again, because we really wanted them to take ownership, I didn't go to them with, this is the documentation you are going to use. Instead, what we did was we downloaded lots of examples um, from around the UK. And we then also um, asked people from around the UK to sort of send us their guidelines. And we stuck them around the training room. And we said, OK, look, you've got 10 or 15 examples of observation sheets, 10 or 15 examples of medication charts. We want you to have a look at it look at what you like and what you don't like, and design something which is fit for your own context. So they spent time doing that. Um, and it was really enjoyable seeing them sort of looking at, in their groups, looking at each of the observation charts and the medication charts and working out how they could design their own um, for their purpose. And I think this was really important. And I think, I think it's the reason why, since November 2013, this unit continues to thrive, even with just four full-time midwives, continues to thrive because they designed everything themselves bottom up, bottom up. So for instance, they designed the early warning score, which is used quite a lot in the West, but in Africa, still when needs to take off. They designed something like this themselves from scratch, worked out what the normal observations were and what the abnormal variants were. Um, and like I said, they designed it by drawing on paper. Chester Hare, who was a midwife from one of the furthest um, health centers, is very good with computers. He designed it, printed it off, so finally it looked like this. Um, Weze Mgungwe, who you can see here from Bangwe Health Center, who's now head of the Safe Motherhood Program, was on her knees designing an observation chart which would help or aid communication between the health center and Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. Um, so this is what the, the, the first edition of their, uh, their observation chart looked like. We're now currently on version four. They continue to improve it time and time again. Um, and then one of the biggest challenges that we had to overcome really was the place, because 
we, we knew in the hospital 15,000 deliveries, there were sick mothers everywhere, from the labor ward to the postnatal ward to the gynae ward, there were women just languishing, languishing in beds, not because the staff didn't care, but when you only have one midwife looking after 100 patients, it's very easy to overlook what's going on with the, with the mother. So there really was a need to really have this central place. Um, we, I, I was very lucky when I arrived that companies such as Rotary and Old Mutual had actually rehabilit rehabilitated and redesigned a space next to the labor ward for a critical care unit. But it had been sitting empty for some time. And that was because they felt that there was a lot needed to open up that unit. Um, and it couldn't be opened, let's say, in the next few months or so. Um, I was quite loath to do training with midwives in a room, knowing that there were sick mothers up and down the hospital. And I had, as far as I was concerned, 19 experts in front of me from a midwifery point of view who were being trained in critical care, but we couldn't use this space. So one of the first things that the midwives agreed on that first day, we're going we're gonna to almost do like a coup and we're going to open the critical care unit. And there was resistance, but the midwives were very strong and steadfast and they decided to open the unit. So they divided into four teams. Um, and each of those teams made up a bed ready for a patient to go into. And while they were making up the bed and trying to source equipment for each of the beds, myself and Miata, the midwife from the UK, went around the hospital trying to find the, the patients that would go into the critical care unit for the first time. And it was really difficult because we find a patient and we think, yes, that one definitely needs to go into that unit. But then the next bed, there was somebody even sicker. So it was, it was a real challenge. But we finally settled on four very sick women one with sepsis, one with hemorrhage, two with hemorrhage, and one with eclampsia, preeclampsia. And we started putting them in the beds. So we then said to the teams by their beds, you've made up your beds now, you've got your equipment, half of your team needs to go and collect your patient that we've identified and bring them to the bed. And the other half needs to stay by the bed and get ready to admit the patient. Um, and so using that process, they worked out how to design documentation to aid transfer from one area to another and also how to stabilize the patient on the ward. So here you can see a picture of um, Team A, which I fondly refer to as my best team, the A-star team, because they were so good um, you know, assessing a patient on the ward who was very sick 10 days postpartum with sepsis after a cesarean section. Um, so she was transferred um, to the bed. And then day two to four was really very much bedside teaching. They didn't see the inside of that room again, the room where I put all of the documentation around because it was very much bedside teaching. There's no point having sick mothers in critical care and you're sitting looking at PowerPoint. So it's very much bedside teaching with myself and Miata, teaching them at the bedside how to manage the patients. And using that, they started to um, work out their guidelines. So what was the outcome um, of that four days training? Well, of course, at the end of four days, we, we met quite a number of challenges. But at the same time, we found things such as the post-test improved from 3% to 93%, which was huge. And these were not easy questions. It was questions such as, you know, what's the circulatory disturbance in preeclampsia? Um, so they were quite advanced questions for midwives who were not used to thinking from that point of view. But the, the, the test actually um, rarely skyrocketed from 3 to 93%, and a number actually got 100% on the test. Um, the midwives were so excited. They danced. They, they sang. You know, they printed T-shirts such as this because after just four days, um, this critical care unit, which people had dreamed of for like several months or if not years, was finally op um, open. And when I sort of looked at the data, and I'll just give you a brief overview of the data, after just one year, so we started in the 18th of November 2013. Um, the same time last year, 2014, 411 women actually had gone through that unit and been successfully discharged. Um, and as I suspected, there were three main conditions, the she conditions, which we were treating and managing women for. So it was a sepsis, hemorrhage, and the eclampsia, preeclampsia. Um, and of course, there were a few other conditions that had to go for the critical care unit as well. So those ones with cardiac or with epilepsy. But these were the three main conditions. Um, and I can say, um, as a result of that critical care unit, the mortality rate actually dropped by half, at least. So whereas we were maybe losing between 12 mothers, sometimes higher than that per month, from these referrals coming in um, from the health centers, um, and of course, we're having a lot of near misses where women were extremely sick, but they were not dying. 
um, we actually reduced quite a number of those bad outcomes and deaths by 50%. Um, where we find that um, mothers are still dying, so now instead of losing 12 mothers a month, maybe we were losing one or two. Where those mothers are dying is just because they have not been referred in early and they come in so advanced that even the ICU cannot manage these patients. So this is something that we need to work on. But from a critical care point of view and the midwifery point of view, they have really impacted on outcomes. And another thing which I, you know, I'm so proud of is just the empathy demonstrated by the midwives. I mean, I've been training midwives for close to 10 years in different African countries. Um, I love, love, love the Malawian midwife. I mean, all the midwives I've trained in every country, they're absolutely wonderful people. But the Malawian midwife, I mean, especially here, Sylvia Mitengo, who's one of the key core staff in the critical care unit, she is, I don't know, so empathetic. I mean, this picture is the front of the book that I've written for critical help early for women in Africa. So empathetic and has really stepped up to the plate. Um, so I'm really, really glad that I sort of demonstrated that people do care about their people. Um, and the midwife really is at the forefront of that. The midwives have continued to demonstrate their um, CPD and to improve the unit by continuing to, to develop the documentation um, and the care that they've given. And they've also started to recognize that prevention is key. So they've been really, really key um, to try and stop sick, sick women coming to the unit and trying to scale up critical care competencies across the whole of Blantyre. Um, and then they've started to write their operational guidelines because once the unit opened, it was amazing. People were from around the country um, asking for guidelines from that unit and asking the midwives, how do you manage preeclampsia? How do you manage sepsis? So they really have um, stepped up to the mark. The other thing that was really, really fantastic, in the black in the middle, you can see here Weze Ngungwe, who you saw on her knees designing the observation chart. She's now head of the Safe Motherhood um, Department in Blantyre. And she was so impressed and empowered by the training, the initial four days training, that when I went back in January to start phase two training, she said, Gloria, I really want us to train all of the health center midwives, especially in the in the early warning alarm or the early warning score. I think it's really important. So can we arrange training? I've spoken to the district health officer. He's agreed to sponsor them to come um, for training. So using her help, we actually managed to train um, 84 health center midwives. And I think that this really has also impacted on the outcomes at Queen Elizabeth because now they're not coming as sick as they were before. So the midwife for me has really, really stepped up. And I think if we can really start to take the midwife at the forefront of all of these initiatives in Africa, I think we will start to see a big difference. Of course, there are always challenges. So we're dealing with a system where antenatal care is still not that brilliant. We're still missing the fact that patients are anemic. I showed you that Venn diagram at the beginning where I said that sometimes it's unavoidable or we attribute to the fact that these patients will become sick. So you have patients coming with a HB of 1.6. We know that women are going to bleed. Um, hopefully not more than 200, 300 mils, but even with that amount, HB of 1.6, 1, 1 of course, she's going to be pushed into that critical level. So there's a lot that needs to be done antenatally. Um, we're having to reuse a lot of our equipment, so ambu bag, bags, the oxygen masks, especially the ones with the bags, all of these things we have to re-sterilize, dry, and then use again because it's very difficult to get equipment. But despite that, People such as Naomi Sangaya, who you can see here on the left, and Sylvia Mitengo, um, that really empathetic midwife, have, are continuing to make strides in that unit. I mean, as it stands at the moment, the unit is run just by four people. Naomi on the right, Sylvia on the left, um, or vice versa, actually. On the left, Naomi and Sylvia on the right. Um, Andrew McQuinger, absolutely fantastic midwife, and Esther Malanga. And that's because with 35 midwives in that department of 15,000, they cannot spare any more to work in the critical care unit. So sometimes people like Sylvia will work 24 hours, they will work 36 hours. It's absolutely amazing, but they're so dedicated to what they're doing. Um, and they don't really ask for anything for themselves other than just really basic things like, Gloria, next time you come from the UK, can you bring us scrub suits? Because we don't have scrub suits. So you can see them here wearing scrub suits embroidered with their name and how proud they are to have simple things like that and to be, rec to be recognized. So now they've been elevated to quite a high level. Um, and I think that will really help their CPD. This is um, one of the very first patients in that four days who was discharged. She was the patient who was so sick. At one point, we were up 
with her all night and I actually thought she was going to die. Um, her respiratory rate was 50, blood pressure was in her boots, um, post was 155. I really didn't think she was going to make it, sepsis after cesarean section. And it was amazing that day five, having gone through that critical care unit and intensive, intensive care by Andrea McQuinja and Sylvia Mitengo, you know, that she's actually here today and she has a live baby and she still has a uterus. So we are now trying to scale up this critical help early for women in Africa. Um, in other African countries, um, the book is more or less written now, um, and we hope we can get funding that we can actually start to push out these very simple, basic, but advanced principles across the whole of Africa. And the midwife, as far as I'm concerned, even as a doctor, has to be at the forefront um, of that initiative. Thank you very much. So like, Gloria, can you see that question? Would you consider introducing this training in the UK? Um, yes, I mean, I think they do have um, training in the UK, um, not specifically for all midwives, but I think midwives who are trained from a critical care point of view and who run the high dependency units um, do undergo this training. So I think a number of universities such as King's College do offer a critical care program. But I think it's important that every single midwife should understand critical care um, because critical care doesn't just happen in a place, it happens everywhere. Um, and I think this really is um, one of the key areas that will really help to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity, even in the UK. So even though our numbers here are very, very low, um, we are still losing sometimes 10 to 12 mothers per 100,000 and no mother should die if it can be prevented. So I, I think definitely there's, there's a need to scale up critical care um, and even if they don't go to a formal qualification such as at King's College, I think a program like this would really help them. Can you see those other comments, Gloria? Yes, I can. Um, so, some are asking, um, they would like to get a copy of the book. So, my details are there, so you can email me and I'll see how I can get a copy um, to you. Um, 
And then there's a comment here about the lack of interest in the respiratory rate. Um, I think even in the UK, um, the respiratory rate really has been overlooked as the first marker that a woman is beginning to go off. Um, and I think it was only when the confidential inquiries um, highlighted it, I think a few years ago, that people have now started to go back to that. But um, I think the respiratory rate is so important. And like I said, with the other observations, such as temperature and pulse, you don't need specialized equipment. You don't even need to have specialized training. Anybody can do it. So I think it's such a shame, given that it's the first marker that the woman is beginning to go off. And there's sometimes that time to intervene that we don't pay more attention to it. So I'm very hot on that when I do my critical care training, that the respiratory rate has to be seen as that gold standard or the benchmark for what's happening with the mother. Um, and then in terms of whether the training can be delivered in other languages, I mean, my first language is English, um, but you know, I'm mindful of the fact, for instance, in Africa, that we have Francophone Africa, um, and I've had people approach me, for instance, from Niger and Senegal, um, interested in the program, um, but their main concern is that um, it needs to be in French. So I am looking into um, interpreting the training materials into French and Creole, and I'm also looking into, I mean, it's only one of me, um, it's a lot of work to do the training, even though it can be delivered very quickly within three days. Um, but I'm looking into establishing trainers on the ground. So for instance, I've got like a cohort of midwives now in Malawi who are more than capable of taking this program forward by themselves. Um, and then in terms of whether the package has been developed um, so a trainer can access it, um, as director of the Institute for African Women's Health, um, I'm looking to develop quite a lot of online materials and downloadable materials that people can sort of access because I think education should be open source and it should be free. Um, I don't think we should, when it comes to women's health, we should be putting a barrier in terms of money um, between knowledge um, and getting help for the woman. So um, I'm looking to sort of get a lot of these materials online for free. Um, but if you email me, um, I can add you to the mailing list and once that's available, um, I can get that to you. And I think if there are no other questions, I think one of the key things, I mean, that term madwife, I think is really important. I think we have to really start getting mad. I think you have to start using quite, how can I put it, um, language which really tugs at people's emotions, that this really is mad. So, I mean, Critical Help Early is one of the programs that I've established. I've established the Art of Delivery um, training program, um, because one of the other big problems I find going to Africa, I mean, in, in the UK, we still have that problem as well, but it's not as bad. Going to Africa, women still flat on their backs in labor, um, and then we're wondering why the baby gets asphyxiated. Um, we wonder why we have bad conditions, why the, the mother ends up with a cesarean section, even that full dilatation. So auto delivery is one program. And then recently, I've just come back from Malawi again, where I've started a training program in ultrasound for the midwives. Um, and I've been I wouldn't say accused by the doctors, but you know, there's a lack of understanding why as a doctor am I focusing so much on the midwife? Well, in terms of numbers, it makes a lot more sense. Um, and then secondly, I just find that the midwives rarely do get it. Um, and I think we need to have more madwives or more specialist midwives that have these high level skills because like I said, they will stop the woman getting so sick. We do not need birth, for instance, to become a disease where we allow the woman to get so sick and then we now develop big institutions around how to deal with it. That is absolutely and completely wrong. So for instance, we've got fistula surgery now, which is now becoming a, a speciality in its own right. Fistula, which is so preventable. Um, we are now allowing the woman to get to that point where they have these horrible holes within their anatomy. And then we're now saying, yes, we now have fistula specialists. That's wrong. Um, and the same thing with um, ultrasound, allowing the babies to die and then developing a big speciality around it. So we need to really start dealing a lot with the prevention and I feel that midwives get that preventive aspect um, a lot more.
Can you answer the question about the changing wife's attitude? Um, I can't see that question. Where's that? Um, I, th I think tra training to change attitudes, really, it has to come from the grassroots. People often say that we don't want top-down approaches, and that's true. Um, they feel it should be bottom-up. For me, my understanding is that it should be bottom-up until it meets the top halfway in the middle. And so that really means that you have to, I don't know, really tap into the hearts and minds of those people at the grassroots, those people at the front line. Tap into their understanding and, you know, what's in it for them and why is it so important. Empower them that their voice will be heard and that their solutions actually make sense. And then I think you actually find that the attitude changes. So in this particular hospital, I have done so much work, not just from a critical care point of view, but on the labor ward where we were getting so many bad outcomes. And, and then recently ultrasound training, gynae ward, postnatal ward. And a lot of it has come about by really inviting the midwives as ex experts, as an example, and telling them that, look, do you think there is a problem? What problem do you think there is? And how do you think we can go about tackling things and giving them a voice for the first time? So we've done quality improvement um, workshops with the midwives where they have designed solutions. So, I mean, this particular unit really has started to change in just a few weeks because the midwives have now felt empowered to actually start changing things. And I think that's the only way to go, really. I don't think you can foist things on people and then expect their attitude to change. They have to understand what the issues are, and they have to understand that it's within their power to change it and why it should be within their power to change it. And then I think you'll find that the attitude and the empathy naturally comes from there. So in that critical care unit, for instance, the midwives have really taken ownership of that unit it's the cleanest place not just in that department but in the whole hospital i mean when you walk into the critical care unit you think you're in a completely different world um, and this midwife see it as their area these are their patients it's part of their job to ensure that the mothers come in and go out in one in one piece um, and they're not mechanical in what they do either there's so much empathy there's the caring and the feeding and the washing and the cleaning and um i think like i said a lot of that has come from them feeling that they have designed that whole program by themselves. And I think this is the way forward for training, I think, not just in Africa, but anywhere else in the world. It really has to be learner-centered, and they have to drive the training, because then whatever outcomes come about um, will be sustainable. Well, I think we all really want to thank you so much. Gloria, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. The slides are brilliant. And as we tell you, the slides will be available for viewing later. So thank you again. Fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. I'm now going to turn off record.